that are you know deeply participatory, community-based, community-led, and empower grassroots actors first and foremost. We are joined by practitioners. We are joined by practitioners from Mozambique, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. To begin with, we hope to have some, you know, conceptual clarity on what legal empowerment is, because this can mean different things depending on the work we do and the context we're in, and the different strategies we use to promote, uh, you know, access to justice. We also want to explore what accountability is for each one of us, and then we dive into the approaches that have worked in the different contexts. And we look critically, you know, like what Andrew was saying, we look critically at what, what has not worked and why we think this is not working. So please uh, feel free to use the chat function to share your questions, ideas, and comments. So to start us off, we have Andrew from JEI Nigeria. Andrew, please introduce yourself, then proceed with your presentation. Awesome, thank you, Amy, um, and thanks everyone. I'm going to try to keep my presentation really as short as possible and um, and just share a couple of challenges that um, that we've encountered in our work. Um, as, I, as I said before, my name is Andrew Mackey. I'm a co-director of an organization based here in Nigeria called Justice and Empowerment Initiatives. And since about 2015, we've been supporting community health educators and advocates um, that uh, work in urban poor communities, uh, primarily slum communities in Lagos and in Port Harcourt, um, and soon also in Cotonou and Benin. Um, so that's um, a bit of who we are. And I guess I'll, sh I'll start with two kind of comments about uh, framing our work. Um, first is that um, uh, we, um, we believe very deeply in, in community advocates uh, sort of leading the change in their own communities. And so our community um, health educators and advocates are um, members of urban poor communities, are slum dwellers, are urban poor individuals themselves, some with health background and some not. And our work is premised on the idea, and I believe this is a shared idea with, with, with many of you, that um, uh, long-term improved access to health care, health services um, requires greater accountability um, between the healthcare providers, both public and private, and, and communities themselves. Um, so that's kind of our premise. That's where we start from. Um, and uh, instead of listening to me, I actually wanted to um, pull up and share the voice of one of our community health educators um, uh, it's a voice note and, and it's about two minutes long, but I think it unpacks some of the challenges that uh, we've experienced, particularly over this last year with coronavirus. So if you don't mind, I'm going to play it or I'll ask Mutano to play it perhaps. Andrew, your co-host, you should be able to please. Uh-huh, okay. Let me share. Mm, okay, here we go. Oh, can I? There we go. Apologies. Andrew, let me play. Wonderful. Thank you, Mutano. Fear and experience that happened with with me this morning with us. I was in one of the communities in the Korodu, 
Ebute Iga to be precise. Now, on getting to that community, my attention was drawn to an old man that is critically ill, that is coughing. Now, the neighbors called my attention and pleaded with me that I should call the NCDC that they are suspecting coronavirus, which I did. I called the NCDC and uh, the number was picked. After some um, questions, I was told to pass my phone on to the person in question. I passed the phone through the window to the man after which the man was engaged and was asked some questions uh, the person as asking the question asked the man if the man is coughing which the man said yes he asked the man if the man has fever the man said yes he asked the man if the man is having shortness of breath the man said yes but he's hungry that it's not that is coronavirus that all what it needs is food only for the person that received the call to tell me that i should take the man to a korodu general hospital the man should be treated after that if the situation persists i can now call ncdc again which i turned down I told her the purpose of that call is for them to come and pick the man up. After testing, the man may be negative and it may be, it may be positive. Now, why I'm doing this voice message is, is to let us know the situation we are in, in Nigeria. These people are not sincere. And so I, I thought that was a useful starting point. Um, the woman's voice you just heard was uh, a woman named Osho Tosin. She's a community health advocate um, that has been working with us for some years. Uh, that community that was pictured is in a slum community, a typical community here in Lagos, um, where the community health uh, advocates work, where they're from um, and where they work. And I think that case, um, highlights a number of the challenges that we face in all of our work. Um, uh, maybe I'll start by giving um, a few further notes. Um, uh, the next day we contacted um, uh, the Ministry of Health and went up the chain to the NCDC in Abuja, their headquarters, trying to push for um, a test to be conducted for this, for this individual. Um, ultimately, uh, we were able to convince them to refer, make a referral to a local health center um, where they said that they would conduct a test. Um, two days later, the man died before, um, before a test could be conducted, before any services could be rendered. Um, uh, all in all, not a success um, uh, by any stretch. Um, uh, and unfortunately, not a unique case. Um, these are the kinds of cases that um, get reported to our community health advocates and educators on a regular basis, and, and they do their best to try to sort of uh, push for accountability, push for access, um, uh, uh, and, and don't always succeed in doing so. Um, and I wanted to share that piece because I think it highlights a couple of the different challenges that we face in our work um, on different sides. Um, one, of course, is the kind of passing of the buck by uh, the, the government authorities. The NCDC is the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. They were in charge of coronavirus response in Nigeria. Um, and uh, very consistently, anytime you tried to contact them and get access to services that were free by law, um, they would sort of push you elsewhere and, and not extend the services, particularly to poor communities or um, poor individuals who, who, who wouldn't be able to pay for those services. Um, um, I think that that voice note also also highlighted a um, a fundamental lack of um, uh, 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 trust or belief on the part of the communities in the health services. Um, in fact, 
um, as we went back to the community thereafter, um, there was very little interest in, in pushing for accountability, despite the fact that the government had failed to live up to their obligations um, and efforts to try to get others in the community tested um uh, in the aftermath of of this suspected covid case uh, were abortive i think it also highlights the challenges of community education as well um uh, i think accountability has kind of multiple faces or multiple sides and um in order to be able to hold the government to account and the health professionals to account for the services that they are supposed to be providing um equally community members need to know the questions to ask and be able to demand um, uh, demand for services and, and care when needed. Um, and um, as, as you heard in that uh, voice note, um, the man was saying he was, he was hungry. And I think that highlights or exemplifies the, 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 the kind of relationship that, um, that many have, have con come to um, have with with government providers, which is to say, um, no expectation of health services <laughs> whatsoever, um, but but rather to to focus on the what people perceive as their own as their own needs without without diagnosis or otherwise. Um, it's a very challenging context, um, and so I wanted to start there. Um, maybe I'll zoom out for just a moment before I pass over to others that are going to share a bit about their work. Um, and I have other case studies that I'd love to share as well, if time permits. Um, but our work in Nigeria has, um, in, in the area of health accountability, um, has sort of three parallel approaches, um, one around community education, one around accompaniment, which is, is what you just heard in a case of someone trying to assist someone else to access services. And then around um, advocacy, um, which often looks like partnership building, often looks like um, uh, uh, legal action to try to hold the government to, to account. Um, that said, often these strategies aren't enough. Um, and, and that's, uh, I think, why we are here today, um, or why I'm here today, I should say. Um, often we find that, um, as in that case, uh, we're unable to move quickly enough um, to, to get services to people that need it. Uh, we're unable to overcome cost barriers. Um, uh, we're unable to overcome um, perception barriers about you know, what, uh, what communities are able to access and what they're not. Um, uh, so those are, the, those are the initial reflections that I wanted to share with all of you to start with. Um, and I'm hoping I can pass over to um, to one of our colleagues in Mozambique to also share some of the reflections from their side um, before we get to our open plenary. Amy? Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you for your presentation and for painting the context quite clearly for us. You started with the context is very challenging, you know, community education is low, there's a lack of trust in the system, you know, this thing of passing the back, it's not a unique situation, I'm sure if we speak to health practitioners in Kenya, in Sierra Leone, it could be the case. But Andrew, what is working for you? Because you are still doing this work, despite the challenging context. What is working for you as you push for health accountability? And what legal empowerment you did, you did allude to the legal empowerment strategies that you use. Maybe you could go into that a bit deeply when you're looking at what works for you. Thanks, Amy. Um, sure, I can give, I'll give one example of, uh, uh, two examples of, of successful strategies that, um, that, we've, that we've been using. Um, again, quite kind of finite. Um, way is, is um, uh, through, um, I'd say through advocacy, advocacy or partnerships. So um, uh, that same community, Buta Iga, um, where, where that suspected COVID case was reported and then not addressed, um, is a community based in, located in Ikorudu in Lagos uh, State. Um, and the nearest health center is a health center called Ofin Health Center. 
Um, and um, for, for many years, we've now been um, uh, uh, working to build a relationship with that health center so that they could, they could have a stronger relationship with the community itself um, and, and perceptions of bias and perceptions of, um, uh, of cost and correct health information could be, could be passed in a time, timeless way. Time, time use way. Um, that said, in that particular instance, and during the entirety of the COVID pandemic, um, nearly all of the public, the primary health centers, the government health centers were closed in Nigeria um, uh, because they weren't equipped to handle, and they, they didn't do any testing, they, they couldn't handle COVID patients, and so they just closed down. Um, so in as much as that's been a successful strategy that we've used in the past, it wasn't available to us in that particular instance, and that's um, but that's one, I think, uh, one, one example of a strategy we've used, sort of building accountability through strengthening connections, um, uh, building bridges between communities and health, and health centers um, where those bridges don't, uh, don't otherwise exist. And another um, example of, uh, of, of success, I would say, is, um, uh, is is really um, more on the health education side. Um, uh, for many, many years, uh, our health educators have been um, uh, doing presentations in their communities and local languages, using theater and video and all kinds of different strategies to communicate more effectively about basic things, about maternal health care, about vaccines. Um, and uh, we have noticed that um, there have been some changes in the way that that communities um, uh, 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 deal with their own health and their own health challenges. Um, greater numbers of people accessing maternal health care services, I think, in part as a result. Um, and so we found that those are successful strategies, again, um, always with their limitations. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you for being so candid, Andrew, and sharing with us what, what is working for you. But even if it's working, it's within a very challenging context. And this is just your reality. So, um, yeah, you set the tone, actually, for a very honest and reflective conversation. I'm happy to pass on the, the back. <laughs> I'm happy to pass on the baton to our colleague uh, from Sierra Leone, Abdul Karim. We do have your PowerPoint presentation. So if you give us just a second, we will set that up and then you can share with us lessons from Sierra Leone. Mutani, please put up um, Abdul Habib's presentation. Uh, just give me a minute to pull it. Maybe Abdul Habib, as Mutano is pulling up the presentation, you could give us a short presentation about yourself, um, your organization, and then we can proceed with the PowerPoint. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, colleague here in Australia. Um, my name is Abdul Karim Habib. Executive Director of Network Movement for Democracy and Human Rights. Uh, the Network Movement for Democracy and Human Rights established in 2002, immediately when the president announced the war was over. And uh, we wanted to do our own bits to complement the work of government to really um, bring peace in our community. Some of the causes of the war it was injustice, human rights violations, so, you know, most of the young people that went to the bush to cause atrocity, they didn't go to the bush because they want to go there. As some situation forced them to do that. So exactly that's why we came to exist and, and government gave us the mandate to operate as a national non-governmental organizations. So uh, since 2002, we have been operating. And uh, today we must say thank you to uh, uh, Legal Empowerment Network, Namati, and uh, uh, for letting us show our case so that uh, you all will know exactly what we are doing. 
I don't know what is happening with the uh, the, the presentation. It's going to be not, um, maybe you need to work on it properly, but it's not clear on my side here. Uh, Ami, I don't know what is happening. So, yes, um, what is, yes, let me, let me try. Yes, I can see that the presentation is pixelated. Um, Otami. Maybe I can try and share it from my end. Okay, sure. It's, is it pixelated from your side? Yes, it's pixelated. Okay, please try from your side because from here it's clear or I should try and reduce this. Okay. Please try and reduce. Okay. So we're actually working in uh, six districts uh, before now. Uh, Sierra Leone has uh, 16 administrative districts. Uh, we work in uh, six districts before now, but uh, because of uh, financial viability, we are just in three of these districts today. Uh, it means where we are, the Western Urban District, that's Freetown and uh, Western Rura and uh, also Kailan districts. That's where we are now because of uh, financial viability. Um, so that's it. Yes. I mean, do you want to go to the slides for maybe this aha, this school? Um, you want to start a presentation no, no, easily to explain uh, to hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, we yes. want to start to okay, thank you. Uh, what is legal empowerment in our context as an uh, organization? Well, uh, Liga, I mean, simply we want to uh, empower the community people to know and use and shape the law. You know, our true community mobilization, we educate and exercise them to national law and policies. You know, and at the far end of the hard to reach community, our people don't even know some of these laws being passed by our legislative. So it is very important because these people elect those leaders. It is very important for us to educate them and mobilize them so that they can be able to know what are some of these law. So that's what us as, as organization we believe that is legal empowerment, you know. And uh, the, the accountability about this, you know, um, the people elected those leader and the people need the elected leader need to be accountable to their people and uh, before our interventions the community people just think maybe it's favor those uh, elected leaders are doing that um you know now because we have empowered them they are now constructively engaging their um, uh, elected representative and also service provider you know on their rights so they now know their rights and they are constructively engaging them asking them so that's where the accountability is but we are not just doing that we are also um, educating community people their responsibility you know you cannot just be talking about your rights without your own responsibility you know so the, the strategies as organization we use um we use um a, a paradigm to educate the community to know and use the law you know 
to affect to, to just the service, you know, delivering to be improved, more especially on the health sector, you know. So the, the, the approach we use, you know, we mobilize the community, you know, so that the community will, ex will exactly know what are the things they are supposed to do. You know, uh, we bring that community are now very much involved in their own health situation. You know, so that is what we as organization, we are doing, you know, and, uh, you know, we all this, of course, we must face uh, certain challenges as organization. Well, before we start, uh, the, the, the health worker, we are thinking maybe it's all about litigation. We are thinking, uh, because, you know, in the quote unquote, maybe they, they are thinking maybe it's a uh, corruption issue. We will take them to court. So we, tell, we inform them that no, it's not about litigation, but we are going to educate the community to know your responsibility to, to them and how they can effectively demand those rights from you and what will be their own responsibility as community people. So it was a little bit challenge and then we, we are able to address that and it is clear now between between the health worker and the community people. Of course, yes, the, the community we work, the culture of traditional practices, sometimes it actually affects our work, you know, and uh, that's why now we are using, you know, the community people, the indigenous of the community because they are part of those traditional culture, so they can able to do their work effectively. You know, so this is this is how we have tried to make sure that we are able to address some of the challenges in our work. Of course, there yeah, are other challenge we have managing our overhead costs as organization. It is usually, more especially during this COVID-19, uh, it's not easy. But these are uh, just quick uh, um, um, rundown I want to present to uh, um, uh, Listina and Dua. I mean, thank you very much. Uh, Abdul, do you want to share with us what is happening here, uh, what the community paralegals are doing, and um, maybe give some context to some of these pictures? Yes, sure. Um, you can see the community uh, uh, community paralegal uh, using the megaphone to actually to educate community people. You know, during this COVID, you don't bring people together in a in a, in a whole confined place, but uh, we use this paraliga, use the megaphone to educate community people about uh, their health rights and other uh, laws that are within the health, you know, politician. And also in the other strategy we use, um, I mean, the community approach, we actually have this uh, um, community compact meeting. This is community compact meeting we use within the heads um, um, uh, premises that bring uh, uh, a facility management committee member and health worker, you know, um, you know, but this is just a small number of people uh, they can help with able to manage uh, between, between the, the COVID law and that of, uh, you know, so that's what exactly uh, we are doing. And those community compact is something unique. The, the community people now know their responsibility and in doing their, those responsibilities, they can now able to demand their rights from, you know, service provider. And uh, before now, community people thought that it was all about government. But now our intervention can clearly educate them for them to know that they themselves have, has responsibility. And there is now, you know, uh, synergy between community people and her health worker because before now only somebody feel before he or she know that the health worker is important but now it's now owned by the people before now it was government business but now the community structures are now owned by the people and they are taking lead in terms of managing those structures so you know they are now taking responsibility to maintain those structure 
based on our education, based on our engagement with community and health worker. And also DHMT, that, that is district health management uh, team. These are the, the, the agencies that represent governments in all these uh, uh, districts in this country. So these community, um, uh, this um, uh, DHMT are very much happy what we are doing. Before now, they were a little bit jittery, but they are not happy. You can see what the other photo is showing here. We bring um, 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 local artists together. So this just so, so just um, uh, give out simple messages about people rights and the laws within health. So this is how you were able to just bring people together. Uh, because it is a family community we are operating. So you you, you can't just call me if you think people will come. But when you call those um, um, local artists, that will really move people to know what, what is this whole thing about. So they are learning by that. So, and, you know, and uh, the, the, the Minister of Health is now calling us at the national level in a meeting to discuss some of these things. It is helping them according to the district health management team. So, uh, that's what we are actually um, uh, um, uh, doing as a uh, um, network movement of democracy and human rights in our community. Since we are just working in 22 communities, you have how many thousand communities really just when you do community, but this is what we are doing. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, Thank you. Just, um, yeah. Thank you so much, Abdul Habib. That is quite encouraging. and. You know, when you say you define legal empowerment as knowing law, using law, and shaping law, it came out quite clearly in your presentation how um, you educate the communities and then they go to the community compact meetings and they're able to take ownership of those structures and participate in decision making for, you know, anything to do with health within their communities. And what is really encouraging is that the government recognizes what you're doing and they call you to the same table and in that way you're able to shape the law from your experiences on the ground. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, would just like to, you know, talk about some of the challenges that you brought about, you know, litigation, for example, people confuse legal empowerment with, you know, strict approach of the law and we're going to sue you, that was quite clear. But when you say cultural beliefs, you know, that is very wide in an African context. Would you like to, you know, break it down a bit and tell us how the cultural beliefs are undermining your work in legal empowerment, health accountability. Yeah, exactly. Let's say, for example, the the the, the FGM. It is a traditional belief, and uh, uh, it is a whole health issue. And if the community want, the community people want to go about their traditional work. How do we able to make sure that these things will not go ahead? And uh, our political people are also believing that they should support, you know, the the Bono society to go on because that's how they feel that the people vote them in. You know, it is whole political team in Sierra Leone. You know, so it is really challenging. Um, so we are using the, the community. For example, we have female prayer league. They can be able to, you know. I mean, many way to manage their way to some of these communities to do their work. It is not easy. It is really challenging. And uh, the Sierra Leone know very well that the community will work. Uh, uh, Bono society is not something you just talk about. You as a man, you uh, women can, can take you somewhere with you feel it is some pain from them. But uh, I mean, but since we are using the the, the, the indigenous of that community, we have able to navigate our ways in some of these challenges. So that's how we are, we, are, we have been able to manage to to go. Uh, go through those challenges with uh, traditional um, uh, practices. Also, many traditional practices also, it is also harmful, you know, and uh, and small thing are children. It is about their health, you know, so all these things. And uh, we are also using uh, main paraligas that are also member of the society. So we are using that strategy to make sure that we can be able to navigate to make sure that people should know the rights of the people and their health is very much important. So the, all this is how we are able to navigate some of these challenges, I mean. Thank you so much, Abdul, for painting that picture for us. I do understand that, you know, practices such as 
um, FGM are quite <laughs> deeply rooted and that presents a really big challenge for the work that you're doing. Um, now that, uh, so we have a good handle of what's happening in Nigeria a bit, what is um, happening in Sierra Leone in some of the 22 provinces that you're working in, would like to go down to Mozambique. And um, to begin us off, we are going to start with a video about the work that they're doing in Mozambique. And then from there, we will be able to have more in-depth discussion. Um, as we put up the video, I would like to invite Eduardo or Ellie to tell us just a bit about this video. Robert. Hello. Yes, Eduardo, we can hear you. Oh, okay, uh, so thank you. My name is Eduard Malo. Uh, I'm so sorry because I have several problems with the connection here. Uh, I'm working outside of, of the office, so I face some challenge, but now I'm okay just to share our experience. So thank you. Thank you. Mutano, please play the video. Meu marido ficou muito doente, depois de muito tempo acusou. Então, ficou muito doente, chegou o um momento em que perdeu a vida. Quando perdeu a vida, fui de novo ao hospital. Sorry, fui fazer o sorry, teste sorry, e não acusou nada. Mas eu ia com medo. O medo era de chegar lá e acusar. Fiquei com muito medo mesmo. Sorry, Amy. Um, the video is not clear. Oh, you can't see. Okay. No. Um, what's about now? We can see the video, but the writing on the video is not clear. The subtitle. Oh, okay. Uh, Meu marido ficou muito doente, depois de muito tempo acusou, então ficou muito doente, chegou o um momento em que perdeu a vida, quando perdeu a vida fui de novo ao hospital, fui fazer o teste e não acusou nada, mas eu ia com medo, o medo era de chegar lá e... Perhaps, Mutano, we can hear a bit uh, from Eduardo about the work that they do as we try and sort out the video that is supposed to be played. Okay, sure. Let me, let me look for another resource. Mm -hmm. And uh, please also share the PowerPoint presentation. So, Hi, Eduardo, I, I don't... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm sorry, but the video is telling the story of Sonia. She faced a challenge when she uh, used the the, the health facility uh, to have access of um, um, a, a service, and also she, she 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 tried to tell us that when we have uh, privacy and health facility, uh, it's easy to have a service in general. So, but next time we will share the video just to have the opportunity to to hear and to see what she telling us about the in the first in the first person. Uh, please, can you help me to hand the, the presentation? Sorry, Amy? Yes, sure, we'll do that. Would you like to present it from your end? Oh. So, thank you. So, um, as I said, my Sorry, name is Eduardo. Mutano. Sorry, Eduardo, just one second. Sorry, Mutano, the presentation is highly pixelated. I will, okay. share I will share my own screen tunnel. I think that also it's heavy because of the pictures. Please just give us a second as we try and get the presentation.
Okay, uh, um, I don't know, but I can so explain what we are doing because I'm living yes. there. <laughs> okay, I think we're facing some challenge uh, today. So, um, my name is Eduard Malo. I'm working for Namati, um, and I'm so grateful to just to share our experience. I know that we have a lot of organizations here. They doing um, a wonderful work and different and different uh, approach. So, um, in Mozambique, in general, we we have a lot, a many policies and law, uh, but in practice, uh, we don't feel it. So. Um, we, we, we see the gap with implementation and the reality. So the reality telling uh, uh, other things, but in the practice, we don't feel that that's low. It is uh, so more easy for the community. And also if these laws um, are valuable for the people in general. And we, we, we have a fear power asymmetry in the, in the context of, of when we are implementing our, our approach. And also we have a poor functioning system of greenness redress in general. Uh, so one example, many people simply don't know what to expect. They don't have adequate information about the service they supported to receive. And also um, the culture of the silence and fear of recollection are very poor powerful here in, in, in Mozambique. They feel that I refer, uh, it is, uh, for example, the, the, the community member have a difficult or fears to complain or ask uh, addressing today, they tomorrow, uh, maybe he will not give me a better treatment because, uh, because, uh, because I, 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 I redress my, my, my grievances. So, this kind of uh, the contest it is uh, can lead to loss of trust in the health system and negatively impact the health service utilization and outcome um the role of uh, health advocate Namati uh, have a lot of health advocates. Some in some countries they calling uh, paralegal. In Mozambique we calling defensor de South, but the same person that we have this uh, health, uh, health advocate work to build the power of patient and frontline health work, health help health workers to increasing awareness of health policy and right and also facilitating the dialogue between community and the health facility to make the health system more accountable to community in several. And also we, we represent a solution to a specific graveness or cases. So um, let me so give you some example uh, to explain, for example, uh, raising awareness of health rights so that patient can more effectively advocate for themselves uh, via, uh, via uh, education session conducive on waiting area of the health facility. In the regular and personal meeting uh, with a vulnerable group in the community, radio and television program, and, produce, and also we are producing material uh, and the disseminating of the range in uh, in this session education. Uh, when we talk, for example, about facilitating the dialogue, Namat Health Advocate worked to create and revitalizing and building capacity of a, a VHC member uh, or uh, a VHC member did exist. They often focus on cleaning the health facility assisting with a vaccination campaign and conducing home visits, but do not play in accountable roles. So in this case, together, we implementing a quarter, we implementing a quarter uh, participating with health facility assessments, 
which serve to, doc to document and resolve specific changes. And also we sit down with a VHC member and health worker to analyze the root case of each program, agree on strategy, and commit to create action to ten line. In terms of supporting patient and health worker to speak, I address very to undermine human dignity and access to health care. This including identifying aggrievedness related to infrastructure, equipment, supply and health workers' behavior, and then engaging authority to find a solution. So when we're drawing on this grassroots data and learning to impact policy and practice in our national level. So uh, the, uh, the NAMATI began working in Mozambique uh, in 2013. We have uh, 44 health advocates on the ground in 68 health facility and community, and four, four Mozambique and 11 uh, province. Rather than um, treat a patient and, and community member as a victim requiring, uh, for example, uh, an expert of, of service. Uh, in this context, they say, I will solve this problem for you. But in legal empowerment, uh, our health advocate, they say, uh, we will solve this together. And when it will be done, you will be able to solve the similar problems. This is the difference. They say, I will, I will solve for you, but the health advocate, we go together hand by hand just to learn and the process and you will be able to solve the similar problem. This is of kind of the context and our approach focus. So, uh, uh, um, uh, so it's difficult to see, but uh, I have here a chart to show, uh, for example, uh, which kind of violation that we, we have collecting in this uh, role of activity. For example, what we see in general, it is um, disrespect treatment. So we have a lot of, uh, more than 16% uh, of our grievances are related about treatment, disrespect treatment. So, but uh, when we use this approach, as I said, uh, we, we're implementing the um, uh, quarterly assessment uh, involving uh, community member and facility uh, health workers. So we, we sit together and we plan action that to solve the problem we are facing. Uh, in the health facility. So this, this uh, methodology helps us to solve the, the many challenges they're facing in the health system. So we, we, we reduce at the 43% of the incidence of the, 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 the grievances in, in health facility where we're working since 2013, for example. That uh, methodology shows us that uh, it's working uh, and we, we're changing life and we, we're improving um, the health system. But also we, we have uh, some challenge that we face uh, during the implementation of our approach. Often uh, initial uh, misperception that health at Bogota are, are, are acting as a watchdog. <laughs> see, just to see if he, the health, health worker are working properly or not. But this is not our, uh, our, our approach. But they understand that the, the health advocating are there to police them. But it's not it, because we have the, the same uh, objective to bring more um, quality of health service, to bring more um, humanization health uh, attainment, for example, it will be able to overcome this dialogue by emphasizing and demonstrating that our mission is the same of the Minister of Health. To improve health outcome in Mozambique, 
This framing has been critical in building constructive relationship with health workers and also um, the work and leaders. We focus on bottom and improvement in the health system by empowering patients and the community and by supporting health workers to play a more proactive roles in addressing barriers to care. We also identify champions, um, I'll sh share with you, we also identify champions, the patients that uh, have more empowered, empowered and we go together to convince the government that what we are doing, we're bringing results and we are changing life. So this is uh, our um, uh, uh, um, experience that I would like to share uh, with everyone here. So I'm so sorry it was enabled to show you the uh, presentation, but I think that in the next time we can so share just to see and underline what uh, you think that this will be useful for your approach. So thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And I'd also like to apologize for the technical hitch on our end. But I think we were able to follow your presentation quite well in terms of your approaches, in terms of you know uh, creating awareness, working with the community, um, you know, to the, the what what I really call the crooks of the legal empowerment uh, methodology is that you will work with the community, and after solving that challenge together, the community that you've helped will be in a stronger position to be able to tackle other injustices similar or even bigger than that. So that has been um, quite illuminating for us in terms of legal empowerment approach. And also just highlighting the kind of grievances that um, you, you have encountered. Um, <laughs> I would never have known that, you know, rude and disrespectful remarks from quite a big chunk of that, um, of the human rights violations that people go through when they seek um, medical attention. Um, last but not least, we have finally this presentation from Francis Katindi. Uh, please tell us briefly about your legal empowerment work in Sierra Leone. Um, what legal empowerment is to you, what accountability means to you, and what is working for you, Francis? If you're speaking, you're on mute. All right, sorry. Thank you for giving me. All right. Thank you for giving me this opportunity at least to share our work experience with the team. I'm Francis K. Musa, working for the Methodist Church in Sierra Leone, and I'm attached to the development wing of the church office. My organization is a faith-based organization, and we do undertake a lot of social actions on behalf of the church in different communities. In fact, we are registered as a national non-organization organization with the government of Sierra Leone. We are given the mandate to do our development work right across the country. In respect of this assignment, we are really doing a project on legal empowerment. And the title of the project at the moment is strengthening health accountability and legal empowerment in the Bond District. Bond District is one of the districts, 16 uh, districts in the country. Uh, it is in the southern region of Sierra Leone. Within the district, again, there are chief dogs. For that project, we are working in four chief dogs using or working with paralegals, community-based paralegals. So to us, legal empowerment is simply building the capacity of people to exercise their rights, either as individuals or collectively as a community. Through legal empowerment, the ordinary citizen can understand and use the laws that will safeguard his or her rights in society. So we therefore use community-based paralegals to promote access to justice and the rule of law, property and business rights in the community. So that is how we view legal empowerment with respect to the projects we are implementing. 
accountability. To us, we consider accountability that is making service providers to explain and take responsibility for their actions while managing social facilities by the ordinary citizen. We empower the ordinary citizen who is down there in those remote communities to know his or her rights so that the individual will be in position to question service providers on the work they are doing. Now, the strategies, there are a lot of strategies we are using. And in our intervention in communities, we are not there forever. It's a project-based work we are doing. It has time. So one of the strategies we are using in this legal empowerment to ensure that when we shall have left the community, the work continues, is that we are doing legal education of citizens through community health monitors. Legal education of citizens through community health monitors. Now, through community engagements, citizens have been identified and trained by the district health management team on the free healthcare initiative. This approach has helped us to promote the understanding of most citizens on the free healthcare policy so that they can hold the service providers that the health workers at their various health centers accountable in the service delivery system. In doing this work or in the project implementation, again, we are faced with a lot of challenges. But one major challenge we are facing is the delay in addressing the concerns or management problems at the health facilities by the government. For example, when the prolegas visit the health facilities through their engagements with the health workers and the community members, they have observed that the structures, the health structures are not in very good shape. Generally, it will be observed that in Sierra Leone, I don't know, for other African countries, we lack maintenance culture. So the repairs or maintenance of those damaged buildings has become a very serious challenge. Now, how do we intend to solve this problem? Because our approach is not knowing and giving, but rather encouraging and working with the communities. So for us to address this problem and so many other problems, one key possible solution is to have continuous engagement. We engage the local authorities and the district health management team, because the district health management team is part or directly under the supervision of the Minister of Health. So when we engage them, get dialogue with them, explain what is happening, and try to let them understand the importance of their intervening in some such problems, we believe we can encourage them to start work on those problems. And also, we believe that through advocacy campaigns, we'll be able to solve some of the problems that are being experienced at those health facilities. So in brief, that is what we are doing at community level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. Um, you know, I like the idea that you are very, you know, aware that this is project-based funding. So we look at the fastest way or the most effective way to ensure sustainability of the project beyond the funding that we're receiving. So the idea of working with community health monitors who will be, you know, even after the project has ended, will still be there will still be sustained and will still be able to continue with the work, I think is something that is quite uh, laudable. Um, this, uh, the challenge that you encounter, <laughs> I, the way you said, you know, we lack 
a maintenance culture of the facilities. I'm sure it's something that runs across many African countries and that your strategy is to continue engaging with the government, not stopping to engage with the government and uh, continue with this dialogue. Uh, one thing, however, that um, I usually find, um, which is a challenge and maybe I can present it to you, you can continue having this dialogue with government and you rarely see what you call some change. And uh, <laughs> the, the same problem still persists. So do you continue with the dialogue or do you now decide that we're going to take it to the street and we're going to protest or we'll just continue with the dialogue? Well, it has not reached that stage yet. It's a gradual process. It has not reached that stage that we encourage the citizens to go into the street. That is why uh, it's rather unfortunate I didn't give you a clip of uh, our success in this dialogue thing. But in the district, the, one of the children headquarters towns where the DHM is, in one of my routine monitoring visits, I went to one of their source where they had this uh, medical materials and drugs because normally when these supplies are taken from the headquarters in Freetown, they are sent to this uh, chief of headquarter towns under the supervision of the district health management teams. My sister, if you had visited that place and see the condition of that building with those drugs in there. So no sooner we observed that, I went straight to the district medical doctor. We call them the DMO. I engage him in a very professional manner and I stay in that town. But when I brought this to his attention, he pretended as if he was just seeing that for the very first time. I said, if you wouldn't mind it, please come with me. Let, let us go and see the place. We went there together with the uh, district head sister. They decided to repair that building because it was an eyesore. So I believe if we start with engagement, negotiation, and the like, we will not reach the stage where the citizens will go into the street. Because um, the way our political system is, no sooner demonstrations are organized, it takes a very different form. So not allow, encourage that one to be the last resort. Thank you so much, Francis. And I see Andrew nodding in agreement with you. I don't know if that's the case in Nigeria. In, in <laughs> any case, we have, uh, we have traveled from Nigeria to Mozambique to Sierra Leone. And we've seen how um, you know, different practitioners are using different strategies, but there's a lot of similarity in terms of accompaniment. Yeah. Dialogue is a big thing. And continuous education is still a big thing. But what really strikes my mind and what really strikes the approach as I hand over back to you, Andrew, is Namati Mozambique's approach of telling the community, well, we will solve this with you and not for you. So afterwards, you're able to you know, tackle the injustice if it ever comes back to you or to your community or to somebody that you love. So back to you, Andrew. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everyone for all of the sharing. It's been really, really wonderful and, and frankly inspiring to see all the important work happening um, and the similarities as well, as Amy noted. Um, I wanted to sort of kick off this next part of our call and um, by posing a question that those of us that gave presentations and others that are on the call also hopefully can fit in on. Um, and my question is, um, is a uh, kind of two pronged um, and it comes from our own experience here in Nigeria. Um, and we find that um, uh, to kind of simplify things often um, cost and urgency uh, tend to be at odds with accountability um, and handling individual cases. Um, when someone is very, very poor and they go to a public health center and the public health center is charging exorbitant fees, whether or not they're prescribed by the law, and most often they're not. And um, uh, often we find that um, 
that people are unwilling to take the time that it needs for accountability to run its course and to access those services for free. And then the similar challenge, which, which again um, uh, uh, borders on time, when someone has, is, is, has a very urgent care um, situation and they contact some of our health advocates and they say, this is what's on ground and I urgently need help. Um, again, um, urgency often um, uh, seems to be at odds with accountability because um, when someone's very sick or in need of urgent care, that really is, is, is what is front and center. Um, so I wanted to share that and ask if others have experiences or solutions perhaps um, for how to tackle um, those kind of twin challenges of, of cost, um, primarily cost, but cost and urgency in individual cases um, and, and whether that's a barrier to accountability in, in your contexts. Uh, I don't know um, if any of our, if our colleagues, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, Abdul, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, our experience here in Sierra Leone, uh, the, 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 the then government uh, was able to have certain category of people uh, to be on free hands. Uh, that's lactating mother, children under five, pregnant women, and uh, EVD survivor, that is Ebola survivor. And now the number has increased by the, the present uh, government, by the aged, and also school going uh, children. But um, there's yet to a, 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 there's yet to legislate that particular uh, aspect. It has just been pronouncement by the former government and also this government even adding a category. There's not been a law, you know, in our law book, and that is what we have been asking Parliament to legislate. You know, free health even if it's the category of people that government has mentioned. And uh, I will tell you, Andrew, here in Sierra Leone, uh, the cost recovery drugs, presently I have been actually uh, saying, uh, raising that at the Ministry of Health, where the minister and others, we sit on the same table as said, uh, the rest of mankind presently, we are not protected by this government because there is no cost recovery drugs for the people. It is just drugs for the category of people that we are just mere uh, presidential pronouncements. This category I just mentioned. So we are seeing, we are seen asking, let there be law. Because when there is law, you know, you now uh, um, use some uh, that particular aspect of the law to engage, you know, uh, community or health worker. But this has been just it was just a, a mere pronouncement. Even though yes, government is committed to it. And uh, then uh, we have uh, donor agencies are committed to it. They are pumping their money, UNICEF and other organizations. But it is yet to be a law in our law book. <laughs> so the issue of uh, uh, having sympathy for people, I think it should not be really called for because it is the people right. It should be citizens' rights. We we elected our leader to provide us the help we are supposed to enjoy in a country. You understand? So that should be our right. That should be the people's right. But as I said in my presentation, it has been like a you know favor government is doing our people. It is only now maybe a gradual engagement with the community people. They have just started to realize that oh, these are our rights. You understand? So maybe gradual process will go to that, you know, having sympathy in mind for people, the age, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, the accountability side, it is something, it is clear because it is our money 
uh, giving, been pumping into this uh, health sector to provide uh, medical facility, even free or not free. There has supposed to be an accountability for that. So we are actually, as our level, we are monitoring uh, that. And um, in fact, at the at any time, drugs is being delivered in the health units where work. The paradigm has always mobilized communities to be there to monitor the number of drugs that are coming in. So the 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 the, the, the paralegals and the facility health management committee monitor the you know how these drugs is being given out to people. So the the transparency side is something we have enhanced that we have clearly informed the health worker you need to involve the community people in their health delivery. You know, they need to know, they need to take stock. The drugs that are in the hospital, because before now there was there were suspicious, you know, nurses has been selling their drugs. So um, for us, in fact, for us it is it is now an uh, opportunity for health worker. Uh, you know, this type of uh, assumption is lead to be gradually. Um, um, it is now history. But before now, it's like you know, community just because the community people people were not involved in that. They are just thinking our uh, uh, drugs is being, you know sell by the you know, health worker. Mm. So mm. yeah, the accountability and transparency side, mm. in fact, we are very much involved in that. And yeah. uh, that's where community people hold the, the, the health worker accountable with the mm. drugs because we are clearly telling that, that this is your money and it is your staff your money. You need to know what is happening with that. And wonderful. Thank you. That's a powerful example on the kind of supply side, transparency side of of, of where accountability comes in. Um, and I see that there's a hand raised from um, uh, someone that joined us. I'm wondering if uh, Blackberry would like to speak up. Or if not, someone else could step in. Um, yeah. And again, I think um, uh, the, to circle back to the question I posed, um, uh, I uh, was really asking if, if anyone has experience at the individual case level, um, you know, where someone's being denied services because of cost or because of urgency, they're not able to wait for accountability. Is that a experience that, that others share or, or not so much in your context? And I think John wanted to come in. Well, um, I, I, was, I was really going to address the issue of um, the aspect of what else can be done to ensure that um, there is accountability in the health sector across the board. I mean, if you can allow me to touch on that, then um, I will be pleased to do so. Um, from what I'm seeing, it's like we're doing a lot, yet our voices are tiny, they are small. And with those little voices, with those small voices, I can see us continuing doing the same thing, but yet difficult to get the result that we want. To urge government to sit up and start seeing the seriousness that the poor are facing. Until we collectively have that voice, and start pushing and raise the voice together with those communities for the government to see that they are trampling on a very basic right of their subjects. So put the aspect of health on top of the agenda, which I believe is one strategy that I see this network moving towards. I mean, not just based on countries, but even um, at the work of the region and beyond. So that together we can make a strong case to the governments across the region to start to, start, to begin taking health issues seriously. And that's why I dug my heart with for one of our clients, one of our membership, which is in the in the Kono district, 
they would have moved a step further to form a district legal empowerment network. If we can have all these networks around as a country and we put resources together, we put voices together and try to push the government to live up to its expectation, I will believe that we'll start getting there. But um, we've been doing this for a long while. As Habib said, um, they started this some 20 years back. But it's to see the same result. We try to add voice at that little level, at that community level, but nobody cares. Nobody cares. So from my side, from my side, I strongly believe collective action beyond community levels, collective action will be a, a strong option to start moving things forward. That's my take. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. That's really quite helpful. I wonder if I could ask our colleague Eduardo um, to comment on this, um, uh, particularly accountability in individual cases. Is there um, insights you have from your work in Mozambique um, about how to tackle this? or anyone else. Hello. Uh -huh. Eduardo, go ahead. Um, uh, if, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Sure. Um, uh, we've, we've heard a lot of really powerful strategies towards um, uh, uh, kind of systems level change or broader advocacy towards accountability, transparency, and health. Um, and I was asking, um, sort of following on my presentation at the beginning, about strategies for tackling accountability in individual cases, where there's someone that's sick and they can't access health okay. services because okay. of cost or because of, of some other barrier. Um, and if you have insights, experiences on tackling challenging cases in, in that sense, individual cases. Um, um, okay. okay, thank you. So um, we, 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 we design a chart that helps us to, to, to manage different kind of cases, um, individual cases, uh, collective cases, um, and also the health advocate documenting this case in the data in Salesforce. So, uh, and then we, we analyze if we, what is the common violation, for example, and we try to navigate a health system to make improvement based on our data, for example, uh, kind by individual case, just to make change at the systematic change, for example. Uh, one of example, uh, we, we, now we help um, the Minister of Health to, def to design the, um, the, um, the, the strategy to against uh, barbary, for example. Um, this uh, kind of violation is sometimes the it is individual start by individual case but we um, aggregate this uh, all of data and we 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 an analyzing just to navigating the government to make uh, for example improvement in terms of health so but we start by um, individual case this is our our experience and also we we use the individual case just to move uh, to the health authority at the district level or uh, for the provincial level to make advocates and choosing them as an example. They face uh, some challenge, for example, in terms of um, uh, uh, um, infrastructure or privacy. They uh, testify that they are this problem, um, I face this. And also, we use individual case just to influencing changes in terms of uh, decision 
and district or provincial or national level. So this is our experience in terms of uh, using individual cases. Thanks, Edward. That's that's really helpful, and it's also uh, useful and interesting to think about building from individual case to kind of the broader policy advocacy, which of course is essential um, um, uh, to bridge that. And um, do others want to come in on this question about accountability in individual cases when people are denied services or can't access services? Um, uh, or otherwise. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, sorry, yes. just comment hello. before. Uh, yeah, can I come in? Yes, yeah, sure, go ahead. All right. Uh, with regards to the question Andrew is trying to put across, he made mention the word poverty, whether the people, when they are poor, that prevents them from getting uh, the services at health facilities. Indeed, that is a contributing factor, but they are, from our experience in strengthening health accountability, we have realized that there are so many other root causes why people are not fully using those facilities. And these problems ranges from shortage of drugs or availability of drugs at those centers, the hostile attitude of the health workers, the availability of those health workers, because uh, in the African setup, from my experience, you see that people who like to live in communities or places where social amenities are good that will encourage them. So our trained health personnel, even the medical doctors, 90% of them are living in cities. When you go down into the communities, we don't have trained and qualified personnel. Also, lack of resources. Corruption. All these issues come together and disturb the running of these facilities. Governments, year in, year out, they come up with very good plans under different names, but if you go down to the grassroots community level, you see that those plans are not being practicalized based on all of these problems we have highlighted. So we believe from our experience is that the citizens, the rights holders, should be capacitated enough to sit in the driving seat, to take responsibility in decision making with regards to the, the implementation of these policies. So if we leave them away and decide to just look at the policies or commitments by government on paper, things will never change. So we believe our focus should be on the citizens, the rights holders. If they are adequately engaged in decision making, with all the attached or relevant knowledge, skills, or what you call it, that gap between this rhetoric from, uh, how do they call it, um, pronouncements made by government will not be realized if they are not actually properly capacitated to work on those things. So that is my take on this poverty issue with respect to whether people are using those facilities or not. I think our focus should be on the citizens to ensure that uh, proper accountability takes place. Uh, if I may, if I may uh, honestly, I think uh, around the table, I am seeing uh, actually struggling to get people complain. You know, uh, probably. Uh, the, the complaint mechanism system has not been introduced to our community people. Maybe the people, community people may have complained, but uh, they don't know where to complain some of these issues. And uh, you cannot complain um, uh, me in my, I cannot complain me in my court 
There's no way. So what I mean, you cannot complain any um, denial of someone's rights about their health to DHMC, for instance, or maybe Ministry of Health. You know, there is no national complaint mechanism put in place. You know, for us as net as net, network movement, democracy and human rights, we are thinking about that. How we can actually have a national complaint, you know, platform so that people can actually complain some of these things. You know, but it's yes to be really. Uh, so uh, we have shared, we have we have shared this uh, laudable idea to the partner, but yes, to be really look into. So probably that is what I believe that community may have this individual complaint, but then maybe they don't know where to complain some of these things, you know. So uh, it might not go forward. So people decide to just endure some of this pain because of their. Uh, their circumstances to find themselves as poor people, you know. But I believe that this complaint are uh, there, you know, you know, because uh, in 2016 we we do a survey. Uh, people we are complaining in those survey, you know, some of the things they went through. But this uh, this were just an uh, I'm a survey we did, you know. So uh, where someone can just come to your table and explain to you this is what I have gone through in uh, X, X and Y, Z and um, uh, health center, you know. So we believe that uh, that type of complaint is what you are actually talking about, rather mm -hmm. than uh, yes, rather than uh, people just uh, think uh, how this how people are feeling. And because we work in the community, we exactly how our community people uh, be, uh, suffer in the hands of some of these things. So, you know, yeah. but we believe that if we have a network, we have a, a, a complaint, national complaint platform, we believe that uh, people will come forward to complain some of these yeah. challenges they are with. Yeah, important observation about complaints mechanisms and their availability. Yeah, thank you, Abdul. Um, Amy, you wanted to come in. Yes, um, just uh, before we segue into the second part, I just wanted to, you know, there's a question of litigation and whether it really helps uh, the situation on an individual case who is unable to access maybe uh, medicine. So there's, uh, uh, at least here, I'm just giving an example of what happens in Kenya. I'll start from the premise that um, our constitution says, I know what the law says and whether it's applied is something totally else, but because of this, a lot of this grassroots work that has been happening and what was happening to the community is that the healthcare. So the constitution now says that everybody is entitled to emergency healthcare. So in the case of um, the individual in Lagos, the voice note that we had in the beginning, that was emergency healthcare. So he would, he would have been rushed to any hospital as per the law and given emergency healthcare. Then from then on, taken to a facility that either is government subsidized or a facility that he feels comfortable in. But there have been increasingly a number of cases where fine, they're taken to hospital for emergency care, but then now the hospital holds on to the patient until they're able to pay the you know, hospital bill, and then they're released to go and access other you know, um, emergency health care that they need. So <laughs> there's been a lot of jurisprudence. So the NGO I'm talking about went to court and the court and the courts pronounced themselves and said this. If somebody comes to you on emergency treatment and they are unable to buy, uh, to afford the medication and you treated them, you cannot hold them in the hospital. You're not a police station. You cannot arrest them. You release them and you work on a way in which you're going to be able to get the money that you spent on that patient. So it became through a lot of dialogue, a lot of advocacy. So right now, as we speak, yes, you are entitled to emergency health care. Yes, you can use the litigation way, but we know the challenges that come uh, that come with this process. And then lastly, uh, the contribution I have is from Francis's observation that um, <laughs> you know people sometimes don't have trust in the government. And there was a study that was done in relation to COVID-19 and the vaccination. A lot of <laughs> Africans, let me just say that in Sub-Saharan Africa, don't trust their government. So they want to go for the vaccine. the global north and 
their vaccines, like I'm sure in Lagos, Nairobi, maybe Sierra Leone, we also see this vaccine hesitancy. So I'm wondering what your observations are on that. Yeah, yes, Amy, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, before we before we before we go to that, I would like to, to say thanks to my colleagues from Sierra Leone, Habib and uh, Mr. Musa and my fellow from Mozambique. I think now we clearly know that legal empowerment is on the work. Legal empowerment is moving. And of course, the topic itself, health accountability, is a very sensitive topic, which every country in West Africa or in the whole of Africa country, they are really expecting that the health accountability is an issue. And it has to be really focused on and addressed. Um, uh, was it the day before yesterday, uh, Monday? I was at the, one of the, these government hospitals. Um, I saw a poster right in front of the hospital saying that uh, ma malaria testing and the administration of malaria drugs is free. Yeah. But then I was standing there for a complete one hour. I saw a doctor coming in and out, asking people who are here for malaria testing and all the rest of it. And he was requesting for money from them. So I also placed myself in the position. So uh, doctor, I'm here for malaria testing and care medication. It's, it's happened to me in reality. I don't see where you have to pay some money. I said, but government says that malaria testing and medication is free. Why do you want me to pay money? And they say, oh, my friend, if you don't want your treatment, you can go away. I say, no, I can't go away, my friend. I say, because government says it's a free of charge. So that is one of my observations of that. Then number two, if you go to these government facilities, each and, ev each and every facility has what we call um, a service charter that tells you what is free and what you are supposed to pay for and how much. If you go to Connaught Hospital, you go to Rukupa Hospital in Freetown, you go to all these government hospitals, there's a big, big ball standing there say, government service charter, malaria testing is free, x-ray is free, this is free. To do a gene test is 100,000, for example. But then the question is, how many of these poor people knows about this channel. They can just see big, 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 but nobody ever have time to even read it with them. So that is what makes the whole thing scary for me. Not that government is not doing their bits, but you're like, you're like what we say, government doesn't have that capacity to go everywhere in Sierra Leone, right down to community level. But that is where the existence of free community civil society organization comes into play very, very active work. Like what my colleague Habib and uh, Mr. Francis Musa were saying that, okay, maybe one strategy that we should employ is that, why can't we go out, get all this information about medical health facilities, what is free and what is not free? And if this is not free, how much? And then we take responsibility of going to robust advocacy. Like I've seen NGOs for this COVID-19 vaccine. They have the time, they have the time to take megaphone do recording and put it in front of hospitals, advertising COVID-19 vaccines. But they don't have time to advertise the free medical facilities government is offering. So that even those who do not go to school, by listening to those audios from those, uh, uh, you know, standing right in front of the hospital, they can learn something. And one point that also came very strongly in my mind when Mr. Habib raised it, the complaint mechanism. If I know that the malaria medicine is free, the testing is free, and I go there, somebody asks me for money. Then I said, no, my friend, I'm not supposed to pay money. And then if you drive me away, where do I go to make the complaint? And if I make the complaint, what action? I mean, you cannot, you cannot just go and make complaint without any action. For example, like uh, the police, they have, they have what they call the CDIID. It's, it's an independent police complaint, complaint commission. That is, if a police officer does not treat you fairly. You have somewhere to go and lay the complaint of the police officer, and then action is taken. So if the police, they have the whole complaint board, then I think there's a need for us to move one step ahead to look at complaint mechanism 
when it comes to terms of free access to medical facilities. Yes. So that is my, my contribution. Yeah. Thank you, Jalo. That was Hello. really powerful, particularly the your own personal experience. I think all of us should be speaking from in the first person more often than we are. And um, so thank you for that. And um, does anyone want to jump in on on Amy's question? Um, Hello. I think Eduardo had a, a contribution to make. Eduardo had a contribution yes. to make. Mm -hmm. Yes, I thank you. To... So, uh, I, I would I would like to uh, say something about uh, the litigation, as you um, say in your introduction. Uh, say that the, here in Mozambique, um, some cases it's possible to um, address uh, using this strategy. Uh, for example, um, in law, uh, it's forbidden to to charge. For example, a patient um, uh, uh, to to assess the medicine. For example, uh, malaria, uh, people living with HIV and TB. It's also it's free, and in law, uh, it's possible to go to the police station and make a complaint that I was charged by to have a medicine, for example. Yeah. Hello, you can hear me? Very well. Yes, we can hear you very well. Very, very, very well. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, for example, people living with HIV, um, in, in terms of law, uh, discrimination is crime. And also you can um, go to police station and make your, your complaint that um, I was discriminated in the, in, 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 the, in the service or in the community. So it's possible to use litigation to solve this kind of, of problem. But for example, um, uh, cases has um, um, disrespect treatment, absentees, and uh, lack of um, medicine, this kind of uh, challenges or cases uh, they are not crime. You, you, you it's must to uh, invoke one pro, one protocol, one policies, but it's not in litigation uh, strategy to solve it. But you can so make improvement in the policy and the strategy of, for example, we have um, uh, humanization strategy. In, in the humanization strategy, uh, the Minister of Health said that everyone have to receive a good treatment in the health system. So when people, when a community member facing challenge in terms of attainment, you can so invite this strategy to make a negotiation with the um, health uh, authority just to make change um, in, the, in, in the health facility in, in general. So uh, I would like so to, to, to emphasize that different case they have a different strategy some of them we can so use a litigation to solve bringing the law uh into the policy station but other otherwise so it is it is possible to solve it uh using strategy and using advocacy to make improvement in terms of policies in terms of protocol so thank you Thank you so much, Eduardo, for that. And then we will just wrap up that part of the conversation and just uh, finish up with the question I had on COVID-19 vaccine uh, hesitancy. So yes, we also know that the COVID-19 that, that comes from the COVAX facility from the government is supposed to be free. Um, I almost paid uh, 30 US dollars to get <laughs> the first job, but I refused. I was, uh, I was a very good citizen and I made a long line at a government facility. And uh, I'm just wondering whether the hesitancy is being experienced on the ground in Sierra Leone, whether we're afraid that the government is trying to inject water in us or make us barren. I don't know, you know, there are very many reasons why people might be hesitant or what your observations are on this issue of the COVID-19 hesitancy. Yes. Uh, thank um, you very much. Yes. Um, Can I say something? Um, with, uh, with the COVID and also the issue of I want to address both. Uh, uh, first, uh, COVID uh, I'm a, I'm a vaccination in Sierra Leone. I actually do a post because government was using composite measure 
And uh, I said, you know, compulsory is not something good because maybe it might be against the international law. You know, I mean, government needs to uh, motivate people, encourage people to go for the vaccination, but you cannot use compulsory measure. And that was what government was, was wanted to do. You know, they even stop people to go to government offices, you know, with, with, if you cannot show your, your vaccine uh, certificate. You know, I'm uh, we do some um, um, posting, and then that was in only to uh, withdraw. You know, people cannot access those places. And uh, the strategy government is using now, what I actually um, in, um, in, um, in, um, in, introduce earlier on that's what they are doing they are now encouraging people just like what jalo just said in some of these uh, health center they have the megaphone encourage people to go to take the vaccine and that's what we are located for rather uh, than using the the the, the by, whatever you call it but, but that was it quasi people to take it, and that is wrong and then with regards to the litigation uh litigation is something might be very uh, little bit, uh, how do I call it, dicey or whatever in terms of errors. For us, really, our scenario, you know, as Francis said, the qualified medical staff don't want to go to this hard to reach community. And uh, if we are taking litigation to those far hard to reach community, uh, maybe the health worker. We refuse to go to this place, those places, those who are like, like the MCH8, but they are the only one that are in this community. They will, not, they will refuse to go there because we are, we are, we are taking them to court. And uh, that will create vacuum in our community. Mind you, we are there to solve the problem, you know? So we don't want to create vacuum. So the issue of litigation, uh, one has to really be careful in the community work. Otherwise, the health worker will, will refuse to go to the, those places because someone will, we don't want to go to court. You know, so uh, in my community, I always say, no, even though we have paralegal, but we are not here for litigation. But uh, we are here to empower you to know the law and also construct slavery, how you can engage to demand your rights. That's what we are doing as an organization. But the issue of litigation, it might be good. But in our community work, hey, I don't really advise that one for now. That's just I want to see with regards to uh, litigation and that COVID uh, uh, law. Francis, as we wind up, what were your thoughts on this uh, hot topic? Hello? Francis, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Francis, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Now, my contribution on this uh, vaccine update is what you are experiencing out there is similar to what is happening in Australia. Reasons are many, but I will zero on, on one, the availability of the vaccines. Initially, when government brought these vaccines, the age category set prevented so many people from taking the vaccine initially. Then later, those who had the first doses, when they went for the second, they said the quota they had had almost expired. It's only recent of reason that they are bringing additional uh, uh, vaccines. Number two, some people have their cultural beliefs. Certain drugs they don't like taking. They have their reservations. And most of this all is the negative influence of the social media. It has created a lot of confusion. I read from a post sent by a colleague in the Gambia, saying a medical doctor, a qualified medical doctor, has made the pronouncement that whoever takes this vaccine will die in two years' time. And after taking the first dose, there was a day when I went through my daughter, Asked me quietly, but I'm taking the vaccine. I said yes. 
she laughed. I said, oh, 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 what's the reason? So, well, people are saying that if you take the vaccine, you die in two years' time. Then I made, more, I made fun of the whole thing. I said, if I should die, then that is my time. Every die has a reason. Every death has a reason. And again, like uh, Habib was saying, the worst of it is this uh, human rights concerns. Government had a very good intention to encourage people to come on board and take. They made so many uh, uh, regulations and that kind of thing. And the human rights organizations said, no, they are misusing people's rights. And it's wanted to result into some kind of confusion that you will not access government facilities if you don't have the vaccine card. So all of these things are at play. So Sierra Leone, like any other African country, those are some of the reasons responsible for the poor uptake of the vaccine. So we need to actually go back to the drawing board and sensitize, educate people there. That's my contribution. Thank you so much for that. Um, Eduardo, I, thought, um, I know you had something to say, but we have to rush into other meetings. It has been quite a wonderful exchange and discussion. Um, this is just the first part of this discussion. Uh, we hope to have another part of the discussion <laughs> that uh, Andrew was telling me about. And uh, maybe we'll have more time to go into detail, more into you know, the community approaches and some of the community you know, perceptions as to health and some of the issues such as the vaccines. Um, Andrew, as we wind yeah. up. So, uh, thank you, me. So uh, in terms of uh, COVID, so I will, I will underline four points here in Mozambique, the context of here in Mozambique. The criteria, the eligibility, the eligibility criteria is so not clear um, you know, which groups will have a vaccine, to take a vaccine, for example. In the government, uh, at Christ, so few vaccines for thousand, thousand people. The mobilization of so we, so we we have more homework to do here in Mozambique in terms of the uh, COVID nineteen. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, everyone. And um, this has really been a wonderful uh, conversation. Thanks for everyone's contributions, honest reflections, challenges. As Amy mentioned, this is not the last conversation and we will circle back with, to all of you with some notes from today's conversation um, and hopefully some ideas equally on how we can keep the conversation moving um, such that we can all continue to interact, exchange and, and, and also improve our work. So thank you, thank you and wishing everyone a very good afternoon and evening. Bye-bye.